This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 336 for Wednesday, October 30th, 2019. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. And boy, do we have some geeky stuff for you this week. Joining me on the show is Megan Townsend. You can find her at oh Megan Townsend on all the social media that matters. Long time no see. Hello. Hi. I only saw you like, what, two days ago? Two days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, So to tease a little bit, uh, we spent the weekend at HalCon, which is a very large sci-fi and fantasy comic convention here in Halifax. Uh, It was the 10th, uh, I guess, not version, it was the 10th year for HalCon. So they're Mm. celebrating their their 10th anniversary this weekend. And Megan was kind enough to help me behind my table, uh, because I, as an artist and a podcaster, am usually working the con, not just walking around enjoying myself. Uh, so Megan helped me out behind the table so we get to hang out all weekend. So we're going to yeah. have all kinds of thoughts about that, which should be really, really fun. But before we get into it, I do have a little bit of a plug. A uh, friend of the show, Ryan Murphy, is participating in Extra Life. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Extra Life is a streaming event that happens across uh, usually late October, early November. There's usually one particular day that's a big Extra Life day, and I believe it is uh, no- November 9th, Saturday, November 9th. Uh, but Ryan is going to be streaming and uh, talking about video games as well as um, playing some video games because he's a podcaster as well. Uh, it's going to be in support of Sick Kids in Toronto. That's the hospital that he's chosen to support. Donations stay local uh, to fund critical treatments, healthcare services, pediatric medical, equi- medical equipment, and charitable care for young kids who are unfortunately uh, sick. And uh, Ryan is going to be streaming on Saturday, November 2nd from 8 p.m. Eastern to 11 p.m. Eastern, uh, focusing on Blizzard games and chatting about BlizzCon announcements, because, of course, next this coming weekend is uh, BlizzCon. Uh, second stream, as I mentioned, is going to be on November 9th. That's the main stream. That's going to be 10 a.m. until midnight. So that's like an all-day uh, feature extravaganza. Lots of different games, lots of cool things happening with the chat. Uh, all of this is going to be streamed at twitch.tv slash Ryan Murphy CA. You can sort uh, sort out the URL for his donations also easily at bit.ly slash extra life Ryan. We'll have all these links in the show notes. Um, Ryan has been participating in Extra Life uh, along with a number of his co-hosts on various podcasts for quite a few years. So he's uh, quite good at it. He's old hat with the Extra Life experience. Uh, he's also been on this show a, a number of times over the last few years and uh, is a friend of mine and and is sometimes a, a business partner. He's a web developer. And so if you're interested in knowing more, if you want to reach out to Ryan, you can find him at uh, Ryan Murphy. Uh, I think it's R Murphy on Twitter. I'll, again, I'll have that um, that link in the show notes as well. Uh, but just check out twitch.tv slash Ryan Murphy uh, CA, and he should have a link to all of his social media there as well. So you can easily get in touch and ask how you can participate and perhaps support uh, Sick Kids in Toronto. So uh, I think it's awesome when I see friends uh, doing stuff like this. I, I, it always happens so close to Hellcon. I'm never organized enough to do Extra Life myself. Right. I know. I feel you. Yeah. So that's, I, I'm thinking though, after uh, I talked to Ryan, uh, this morning, I uh, I thought to myself, like, you know, next year, if I just if I can just think far enough ahead and get kind of the extra life stuff planned out, then I could just roll right into it after Halcon. Like, if I do it ahead of Halcon and just be able to just like hit the go button the week after, uh, I think that would be really good. Because then at Halcon potentially next year, I could be promoting it as well. Like, hey, tune in next weekend, you know, uh, and and come hang out and do that kind of thing. Um, I am so new to streaming that I'd have to do a lot more research than I feel like I have time to between now and this weekend or no, or yeah. even, or even next weekend. So I'd, I'd rather than just kind of go at it with like a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of knowledge. I'd rather be able to like maybe get the spawn chunks community behind it. Like if, if, if we have been plugging it on the show for the last month, you know, then, then we could potentially have a lot more and do a lot more. So 
Um, I'm going to put it on my to-do list for next year. That's awesome. No, they, they had a stream at Halcon actually yes. as well. It was with like Extra Life Halifax, I think. It's like there's like a specific Twitch channel for Halifax. Yes. Uh, and one of the Halcon guests was playing on that one over yeah. the weekend as well. So speaking of, we can dive right into the main show topic this yeah. week, which is going to be, of course, talking about Halcon. Uh, you and I actually did this last year, which was super fun. So I thought I would I would do it again. And this year is pretty unique because uh, this year you were behind the table with me. You were mm-hmm. you were hanging out and and working with me all weekend. So it was a different con experience for you. So rather than me going on a big long rant, I thought I'd start with you and just kind of say like, so as someone that has been to Halcon a number of years as an attendee. What did you feel was like the big difference between that and being behind a table? Like, what did you did it feel strange at all? It did. I felt like I had a bit more access to things that I didn't have access to before, like being able to watch my friends line up in a big lineup outside the convention hall and be like, okay, bye, see, I have my own private entrance. <laughs> Peace out, plebs. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, it does feel like well, that, though. Like, when you walk by like a that. giant line of people, you do feel like, yeah, I'm part of it. Like, I'm a professional, I'm part of it. you know? Yeah. Um, so, like, that was that was kind of neat. Um, and I, I feel like that was really the only difference. Though. I mean, it. I feel like it filled up my day a lot more, too. Um, I know in past years, and this is, like, no one's fault, but just in terms of, like, co- like panels and events that were being held – between the stuff that I was really interested in seeing, um, oftentimes there'd be like an hour of just nothing. There'd be nothing that I was interested in seeing or like something that I'd, I'd you know, a panel that I'd finished, um, you know, ended halfway through another panel I wanted to see or like there was an hour stretch between two panels I wanted to see and nothing in the middle, you know, worked. And you can only walk around the dealer's hall so many times before you're just like, all right, I don't have any money. Um mm. So, you know, it was being having like a home base, I guess, uh, really filled out the day. And then like the times that you weren't at the table, um, you know, it felt I felt focused and I was still able to sit down and I kind of was able to to do my thing. But, you know, I was still able to have good conversations with people and probably more conversations with people than I would have had previously. Um, So I feel like when I'm, you know doing my thing at a convention i'm doing my thing i don't i don't often stop to chat to people unless i know them Mm. but this time around i was able to talk to people who i didn't know and um you know got to hear some people's experiences and life stories and um it was it was i i I really liked it it was very very interesting and i liked seeing the process of you know behind i think it's my first time ever being at the con when it opened I, I, oh, every right. other year I probably only showed up around noon because I often went so hard the night before that I didn't sleep or mm-hmm. I didn't go to bed at a decent hour. I was usually cosplaying and I had to do some last minute crunch on my costume and I still only got about maybe collective 15 hours of sleep for the whole weekend. Oh, you and me both. Oops. Yeah, um, you and me both. But, but um, no, it was really good. I like... I think in future years, I, unless I'm doing like a big costume or something, I will try and, and get there as early as possible because it's like, it's a nice morning. And, you know, I, I wasn't wear like I was still wearing costumes, but I wasn't wearing anything elaborate. Um, I think my most elaborate costume of the weekend was on Saturday because I had a wig and I had prosthetic ears on and putting on the prosthetic ears probably took the most time right out of my makeup plot. And yeah. really then it wasn't even that extensive. Um, but what's it was, funny is that know, I feel like you got the most compliments on Sunday when it was just like this thrown together kind of like I'm gonna be sort of like maybe an elf maiden or a hobbit or something, uh, yeah. And everybody's like, You look great, and it just I think it's because it just looked so casual. Like, I mean, all these simple pieces fit together very well. You had ears, you had your natural hair, which I mean, really is not terribly different from the wig that you had on. No, it's <laughs> well, it's like you were there when the two girls, like, I, they were dressed as chigo and kim possible and i was like oh i did chigo a couple of years ago and they were like you have the hair for it i'm like oh i wore this wig when i was chigo they're like that's a wig <laughs> they completely lost their minds yeah um, it's a lace front wig for anyone who's wondering so it looks like just the way the lace is cut it looks like it's growing out of your hair um but it's very dense like i need to i need to like thin out the wig a little bit like thin out the ends because i think the ends are a bit too thick at times and i need to thin out the hairline to make it look more natural mm. um 
but that's a process and a procedure and something I just haven't been willing to sit down and do for a little bit. Also, I feel like cutting up a really beautiful wig is very anxiety inducing because it doesn't grow back. Yeah. It's, it's stuck that yeah. way. It's going to be it, permanent. Is, is the so. kind of thing where there might be people in the um, cosplay circles that are also trained hairstylists and might be able to either help you out or give you tips with? Uh, not really. I mean, cutting a wig is a little bit different than cutting real hair because... Right it falls differently than real hair does and it, and hair will fall differently on every single person. Um, you have to be careful about when you cut a wig because there's wefts, like there's like lines, like horizontal lines of hair stitched to a cap, like underneath all the hair essentially. So you have to be careful of, of how, how much you're cutting and how close you're cutting to the head because, um, you know, if you cut too close, you can just start showing all the wefts, which can not look very great. Mm. Um, so it, it, it is a little bit different. I think what I might do, my roommate has some thinning shears that I might just thin out the ends a little bit because the ends are very, very thick. And that's that's a, a usually a pretty big indicator of if something's a wig or not, if the, the ends are very nice and full and voluminous and not right. typically ends of hair. If you see natural hair, it's a little bit thinner right. at the ends or you can see some separation. Um, now, like Arwen is supposed to be an elf and therefore eternally, suddenly beautiful and, um, you know, has very nice, lusciously thick elven hair. Um, but the, the, just the weight of that wig for comfort is very heavy. It's a very heavy wig. By the end of the day, my hairline was hurting. Oh, and that's right. why on, that's why on, um, on Saturday or sorry, on Sunday, I was like, no wig, absolutely <laughs> no wig. Yeah. No way. Like I was staying at my boyfriend's house on, um, on Saturday night and just like my head hurt so bad. And I was just like scrubbing at my, at my scalp the whole mm. night. And he's like, are you okay? I'm just like, yeah, I just have epic hair hurt. I don't know if like <laughs> girls would probably know. That's what it's yeah. called. That's what girls would probably know what that is. If you keep your hair in a ponytail for too long and then you take your ponytail out and your hair. Just oh hurt. yeah. Like, yeah. Hair hurt. My, uh, I'm not sure if she still has quite as long hair as she used to, but uh, my friend Brittany used to be in, in the city and, and she, um, she had very long hair, like kind of like down to her butt sort of, sort of mm. situation. And if it wasn't Mine's getting there, if it wasn't put up in the right way, then the weight of it would tug. And I remember her complaining about it one time. Yeah. Um, I know that you got a lot of compliments over the weekend on your dresses for your, your cosplay. And I know that you yeah. had picked them up online. What, where did you get them? Uh, it's a website called Holy Clothing, Holy, Holy Clothing, Holy. It's H-O-L-Y clothing dot com. Um, and they're, um, uh, everything is made ethically in India. So it's an Indian owned company. Um, and it's, I think it's, a, I think it's based in the States, but they, they've traveled to India frequently and they, they only mm. have a certain number of people who work there. So they pay them all very, very well. Um, that was like, that's a thing that I, I try and look at now. It's like, okay, if you're, if I'm buying something that's made not in the States, how is, how are the ethics mm -hmm. of it? And they like the, say how they treat the workers and all that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And like, unless a company, you have to prove that you are an ethical company if you're going to sit claim that you're an ethical company. So that's a thing that you actually have to, there's a lot of hoops to jump through if you're doing that. Right. Um, so they say on their website right away, we are an ethically sourced, like we, we pay our workers fair living wages. Um, so that was, you know, a big thing for me. Um, but they were, they're nice dresses. They're beautiful. And I was wearing the one I was wearing on Friday, Sunday was called the Renee. Um, and it was, it's like basically like a white, I mean, there's photos online. I'm sure people will see, but it's like a white, um, chemise with like flower billowy sleeves, like, like poet sleeves with like a tighter wrist. And then there's like a blue overdress. So I kind of, everyone on Friday was just like, you, like, I got a bunch of different questions. Like, are you Belle? Are you Snow White? Are you uh you know drew barrymore's character from ever after are you just mm. what are you and i'm just like i'm i'm something that's what i am i'm something i have no idea um part of me was like it could be my D, &D character i just wanted to wear a fun dress um and then on sunday i kind of just took it and it was like me yeah, i have extra pieces i'll just throw these on to kind of give more interest and that for whatever reason was the one that everyone was just like yes this is what we'll take photos of um and then uh the other dress i wore on Saturday for Arwen is called the Arwen. It's named the dress is called Arwen. Um, because they give them all uh like character names, I guess. 
Um, what makes it easy to differentiate rather than like blue, blue ruffle or you know blue yeah. you know um, you know empire waist or like whatever it is like it just they, exactly. it's easier to just give it a name and and call it yeah. that. I do the same thing with my prints like I don't call them just I mean people just say can I have the spider man you know it's the only spider man print I have but uh, for me because ultimately I will probably have more than one spider man image over the course of my career uh, mm. it's called spider man thief on yes. my end right or yeah. you know uh, Deadpool bazooka love is one where he's hugging a bazooka. So it's just a little bit on my end just to kind of make it easier rather than calling it like, you know, Deadpool one, Deadpool two, like you know, it's just yeah. a little bit easier to, to differentiate between the different. Well, it was um, also skews, easier right? for me as well. Like, yes. Right. I was helping out with you with the, with the iPad and mm -hmm. you know, you have, you have it very well organized where you, you know, there's photos of them, but there's a few that didn't have photos of them. But even if, um, you know, just judging by the name, I was able to tell exactly which one it was. If it were numbered one, two, three, I'd would have been like, ah, uh, which one's one and two yeah, and three again? Exactly. Like, I have no yeah, idea. Exactly. Um, and, and Square is so good at that. Like, I mean, for a little behind yeah. the the scenes for people uh, using the Square, uh, what's it called? It's, it's the Square app, but it's I can't remember the, the full name of it. Um, but it's it's the checkout. Like, it's like you you and it gives you the option to have visual cues, and it could be anything, and you can use the. Uh, the tablet or or your phone to take a picture of something or like I've done I sent the images that I have digitally to the device that I can then just kind of go into my gallery and add them so it's not a crappy photograph it's actually a pretty solid graphic representation of what the print is and mm. and then once you tap on it it'll say oh Joel has two sizes of that he's got the large print and the small print and then you just tap the one that they're buying and it gives you the price and it calculates the tax and it does all this I get daily reports from that you know like it doesn't ha and the, the beautiful thing about it is that we were online but you don't have to be it will just mm -hmm. track all the sales offline during the day and then when I get home and connect to my wi-fi it then uploads it to square uh, and it is nice a fantastic point of sale system uh, for anybody that even if you only have a phone, you know, it's great for an iPad because it's much easier to just reach over to my left and just tap buttons on a decent sized display, mm. you know, or, you know, or, you know, it's a, and Square is available for all kinds of different tablets, but like you can, even on your phone, then you know, you'd have at least some connectivity because chances are you have, you know, LTE or 3G or something. Um, and so the, the possibilities of, of being able to do more there is, is fantastic. And uh, I've I've been using it for years, and uh, and it doesn't take much. Like the tablet that I have is, oh it's gosh. old. It's old. It's it's it's, uh, <laughs> it's old. Two thousand. I mean, it would be in the early or late aughts. Like it's it's coming up on ten years old. Wow. Because I've I I got it shortly after I got my laptop, which is from two thousand nine, and so if it's if it's not ten years old, it's close. Mm. Uh. And still holds up, you know, because no, I'm not doing anything fancy with it. And it's a little bit slow to load, but once it's loaded, it does the job. You just have to be a little bit patient with it because technology has changed quite a bit, you know, in terms of touch screens in general are just faster and resolution is better and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the battery lasts all day long. Uh, and so uh, until it completely fails, like, I mean, it's an excellent, you know, device, you know. And the other thing that's nice about it, and not to sound you know, doom and gloom, but if something happens where it was stolen from my table at some point, it's not really the end of the world. <laughs> you know, like it's, no. it's not like the brand new device that's worth thousands of dollars. Like I, I couldn't sell this for a hundred bucks. Right. So no, no, it's better just to have it as a nice backup in case anything ever is needed. But, um, but it's, and it was good to know because this is now, I think you're the third person that I've had behind the table. Um, Mike, my friend Mike, and uh, our friend Alistair has helped me on, on an occasion as well. And it's very easy to pick up. Like, it's not a hard thing to learn. So it's not like, you know, the person has to be well-versed in what I do or even well-versed in sales and, and POS to know how to do it. Like, once you do it once, it's just the same process over and over mm. again, which is which is nice. Um, while we're talking about that, um, I want to touch on the fact that... Um, I, one thing I do find very, not grating, but it's the same conversation over and over again. Whenever you run into another vendor at the convention, they always ask how your weekend is going. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, it's fine. Or, oh, yeah, it's, you just kind of gauge the mood, even the tone of the question. It's like, so how's your weekend going? It's like, well, it's a little bit slower than I'd like. And the, But that's the, it's the same answer. It's either like, oh, it's going good, or that's a little slower than I'd like, but it's never terrible. Even if it is terrible, no one says it. You know, because yeah. no one wants to sound like they're having a bad weekend. 
And no one also says like, it's fantastic. I'm making thousands of dollars because like if the person you're talking to isn't, then it makes them feel terrible. So it's right. the same meaningless conversation. Um, but I wanted, I mean, I don't have the numbers yet because I haven't actually done the, the, the books from the weekend. I have all the data, but I've been podcasting for the last couple of days, so I haven't mm. had a chance. But busy anecdotally, yeah. So Friday, uh, it's a three-day con, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Uh, I do also have the data from last year. Uh, which is another great thing about Square. Like I can look this up in seconds on my computer. It's fantastic. And so I did that before the show just to kind of get a rough kind of estimate. Uh, Friday was a bit busier than last year, which is good because usually Fridays are days that people have to take off work to attend the con. Or if they don't, they're not attending until four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And so uh, as I predicted, my three to five window on Friday got quite busy, right? People that mm. were coming later in the day, they might have taken the afternoon off work, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And that's good. And usually a busy Friday is great because it su suggests a busier weekend when generally the foot traffic at the convention is going to be a lot higher. Um, Saturday was slower than I think everyone expected. And the reason why I think this is, is like last year it was a brand new venue. So people were not really too, too harsh on, well, it was a really crap year or it was really slow because not only is is the um, the Halcon organization new to the building and ironing out kinks etc but so are all the attendees like they're they're trying to find where things are when things have been in the same place for the last six or eight years mm -hmm. uh, well not six or eight but maybe the last five or six because the scotia bank center and the other trade and convention center was a, the same layout year after year pretty much and so uh last year people were not so hard on it now this year it was a great layout it from what I thought from the outside in that all of the vendors and the guests in terms of like comic guests and stuff like that and authors were all on the same floor. Yeah. They, they put all of the big vendors, like people that needed a 10 by 10 booth on the outside of the big fifth floor ballroom, like the outside edge. Mm -hmm. think, think about it like a shopping mark, uh, market, like a supermarket. Uh, so all like the, the produce and the big things like the meat and the, and the frozen food are all on the outside. And on the inside aisles were all the smaller tables, the artisans, like the people like me and, and people making jewelry and stuff like that. And they were usually on the inner aisles closer to the center, which is great because it means that, you know, big lines at big shops weren't interfering with small tables that don't do a lot of traffic. And then everybody kind of had to walk through and buy all of the other artists to kind of get, you know, in and out. And then they had the bigger displays on the end of the aisles that were sometimes food vendors or people that had like big stuffies and things like I, that. I, I do have something to add to that though. And they put, I feel like they put Vandal Donuts in the wrong spot. Yes. Um, they yep. should have put them next to, I think, the tea place. Yep. Because yeah. Vandal Donuts had like that, they had a lineup, but there was a table, like there was a period of time where I was like, oh man, is this lineup for the table I'm going to? There's like, no, this is for Vandal Donuts. And I had to like sneak around the line and I was like, yeah. oh, that's not good. That's nope. a bad thing, but I've I think it was there. like, yeah, if yeah. that's awful, I and mean, that that sucks for a lot of people. I mean, you know, this this particular table is like it's three separate businesses, kind of all into one. Mm -hmm. So you know, they weren't hurting, but if it was like a smaller artist like you, or like an independent artist who wasn't as you know wasn't well known, um, they probably wouldn't have even been looked at at all yeah right? I, which is kind of a bummer now they were on a corner so there's like you know basically an l-shaped table that they could take a look at but mm -hmm. still like when you're when your primary point of access is like the aisle and not the side table like to talk to somebody um it, it's difficult like yeah that yeah, yeah. they should have put them out elsewhere like yeah on the, on the outer edge yeah and, and and i mean and that's the kind of thing where they just they make a mental note of that and say okay you know mental note maybe we have to move all food vendors even like cause, and vandal donuts had a small i think the, the the problem there and and what happened was they only needed a small space yeah right so they they only want to pay for a small space because the booths are bigger and more expensive and so mm -hmm. um even though they tried to move them as close to an end as they could i mean it's good that they weren't in the middle right there could there was worse places to put vandal donuts um, yeah, but yeah, I think they maybe have to accommodate some smaller food vendors or smaller places that have a longer line, even if it's a craft or something like face painting or something that takes a little while where there's like a, a line, you might want to try to even have small, uh, some spaces for small tables out of the way. Uh, I had this experience a few years ago when I was actually a guest at Hellcon, uh, and I was uh, releasing my Starcross book and I was in the guest, um, section 
along with all the other guests, including some very well-known authors. And I don't remember who it was. It was like Terry Pratchett or like some big sci-fi fantasy author was, you know, two or three tables down from me. And when they showed up to do a signing, the table for the line for them went out the door and right across yeah. the front of my table. And I remember talking with, you know, one of the Halcon handlers. Uh, I'll leave her name out of this in case she doesn't want to be <laughs> mentioned. Um, but it was like... Do I know her? Yes. Um, okay. And, and, she, and, and it was one of those things where it's just like, it's great to be in this hall for the traffic, but when lines like this happen, no one buys anything because no one can get to my table. Because with the line, instead of going the middle, down the middle of the aisle, allowing people to walk by on either side, was scooched over to the, the side. And so there's all these people that are standing in line looking at my stuff and talking to me, but then they move four feet and then they go to pay and get signed by this author that they're waiting in line for. Like no one was buying or talking to me. You know, well, they were talking to me, but no one was staying and coming back, right? Mm. And, and people that were walking by couldn't get to my table because like you said, there's a big lineup in front of it. So, um, but that, and that's the kind of thing where like, you know, I can't even pretend to imagine what it's like to try and predict and or steer traffic like that at a convention of this yeah. size. Like, I mean, just hats off to the, to the volunteers that, you know, and, and the organizers. Oh that my God. Yeah. And... No, that's, this is definitely not yeah. like a knock on like, Oh, you should have done better. This yeah. is like, they, they have a lot of things to think about. Yeah. And it's, um, and it's nice, but it's, and when you have a problem like that, like that's a small thing in the overall, you know, sort of grand scheme of stuff. And that's just the kind of thing, like you make a mental note. It's like, all right, yeah, Vandal, we got, they're really popular. That's awesome for them, but we got to move them somewhere where they're not going to block any traffic, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and that's cool. Um, Saturday, like I said, was slower than I think everyone expected. Everyone that had that little kind of like service level conversation with me all felt that it was slow. I felt that it was slow. Um, I, I also don't really know why, because this is now the second year in this venue Everyone was in the same place. They weren't on split floors. Uh, my guess is just that there was enough going on on the other floors, and the other floors are far enough away. Yeah. Uh, with like two two escalator rides, that people just either didn't bother to come upstairs, or um, they just didn't. It just didn't seem to be as much of foot traffic, which was strange because you'd mm -hmm. think that it would be very heavy. Now there were some times when it was heavy, but on Saturday given what I had done on, on Friday. And actually I shouldn't, I should mention, I'm not talking about my business specifically. I'm talking about just Saturday in general, just felt light in the room. This, it did. The number of people for, for the Saturday felt really light. Um, yeah. Even being there, I was just like, Oh, that's yeah. weird. And I did, I did lighter, you know, like I did a little bit less, you know, I did less business on Saturday than I did last year. And, um, but Sunday was like the big dip. Sunday really, mm -hmm. really fell off. It was busy around like, I want to say two to three, maybe. Um, but then after that, it was dead. Like when I got back from my panel, I barely saw anybody. Like I basically just sat there and waited for the convention hall to close. I talked to people. Like, I mean, I, I was always engaging and always saying hi. But I noticed there was fewer and fewer and fewer people uh, going yeah. through. And I don't know what that what what happened over the weekend in terms of panels that was such a draw because a lot of the big actors ended up canceling and so i do know that there was the john barrowman and i don't remember the guy's name from um the harry potter film the um oh god i don't even remember he he played <laughs> he was in he, harry potter he played the mug no it wasn't harry potter it was the uh, the newt's scamander and he played the the muggle buddy the guy with the beard I he did yeah that was him Pretty sure that was him. Anyway, um, their panels were back to back. So it was like with the lineups for each panel, it was roughly like, you know, a three hour window of Saturday where like no one was at the, at the vendor hall. Um, oh, but, Dan Fulger. That's who it is. Yeah. But I'm thinking to myself like, well, if all of the celebs that were supposed to come showed up, like who would be in the vendor hall? <laughs> you know, I, it was a little bit surprising in, in that way. Um, so I don't know. Like, I mean, it's, it's and, and this is not a criticism of, of the con. It's just like, a, it's weird. It's so strange that this huge convention hall that there wasn't uh, more people because I'm, I'm pretty sure and anybody feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I think I saw online... Um, from Halcon that 20,000 people went through the convention at one point or another, which is much more than the other venues could have handled. So you would think by just pure numbers that I would have seen more people walking by the table and or sold more stuff. Um, mm. So, and, and I want to put a big caveat on all of this and say that 
I have not had time over the last year because podcasting has taken off so well for me. I haven't had a lot of time between podcasting and client work, which pays the bills, to draw new stuff for conventions. I actually bowed out of two other conventions this year because I just didn't feel it was going to be worth the week prep and, and you know, getting the extra prints and like getting all the my stock back in and getting everything sorted um, for the smaller events that don't have the foot traffic that Halcon does. Now, was Halcon this weekend worth the prep and the experience? Absolutely. You know, like I still surprisingly actually, I felt did did well considering I haven't had any any chance to put out new work. Um, I think I lucked out. Uh, I think that there was a lot of people this weekend that had have, have not even been to Halcon before. Yeah, a lot and, of new faces. Yeah, so in that way, my work was new to them. So awesome. Um, so that that helped. Uh, but I think over the course of the weekend, it was about thirty percent less business than than I did mm. last year. Um, and then even then last year, I only had like two or three new prints. Like it wasn't a lot. Um, I also think that because I did not vend at the other two conventions this year, which are both local to Halifax, that probably people that were looking for me this year only saw me at Halcon. Mm -hmm. And so I'm debating my convention strategy going forward because I really like Halcon. It's a lot of work. It's exhausting. Uh, but it's better organized. Um, I shouldn't say better organized because decaf is also fantastic. Um, but decaf is like a six hour Sunday. Like it's just this intense yeah. blitz. Uh, and, and you can, and, and sometimes can't make, you know, enough money to make it worth it because it's, it's, it's a lot of prep for just a small window. Whereas like on at Halcon, if you have a slow Friday, there's a really good chance that you're going to make it up on the weekend. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the smaller convention, sometimes you don't have that option. Um, anyway, um, the foot traffic alone at, at Halcon usually makes it, makes it worth it. Um, and that's what I decided to do. And I want to, for anybody else that's a, either a young artist or people that are out there that do vending and they're maybe new to it. Um, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that you kind of have to let go. And if the, the luck of the year is just like, it's just slower foot track traffic, people aren't, you know, necessarily buying a lot of stuff. I can't, say for sure because i've never actually looked into buying tickets to halcon seriously but i heard that they were more expensive than they had been previous years they are yeah so, so uh, in that, if that's the yeah. case that means that attendees have less money they've spent more money on the ticket and if they have the same budget that they did, they did the, the year before then they don't have the money to to spend on stuff that they normally would have they have less so they're probably only going to buy one or two things as opposed to four or five um not from me but like from the vendor floor in general uh and yeah. so you know, taking all that into account, when you realize that it's not going to be a big weekend, I just stopped focusing. By the end of the day, Saturday, I just kind of said, all right, this is, this is, I might make it up tomorrow, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to worry about it. I had a couple of commissions. I ended up delaying them because um, one guy was okay with getting it by mail. The other one's local and he's been very patient. So that was fantastic. The one person that I completed the commission for was Hannah, um, She's, she's a return customer and she did, she's the, the person that got the uh, Billy Boyd commission from last year that she then got him to sign. I drew him as, as Pippin and mm. she got, she got a John Barrowman signature on a Jack Harkness uh, illustration this year, which is such a cool idea. And she's in town from, from Ontario. So like, I just, I didn't want to let her down. So I focused on getting that done. Um, but I, and she I, also pre-ordered. Yes. Yeah. That's the other thing yeah. is that, that she, she, even though. I really only got to doing it a few days before the con starting it and then finishing it over the course of the weekend. Just having the mind share, like having the mental prep of stuff. I think I might have to just stop doing commissions during the con, have commissions open, but have it be like, you got to order ahead of time. You know, like you have to do it. The only other thing I can think of is that I have to come up with a, a cheaper con sketch with that really only takes me an hour that I can do right there behind the table and have it not be yeah. so... Like likenesses are really difficult to do because yes. they take longer. So if it was just like, I like your Spider-Man. Can you draw me a Spider-Man? I'd be like, yeah, sure. I just like, you know, like I have whatever I feel like the price is for that weekend and just be able to do it very quickly behind the table, I think would be, would be good. Um, I spoke with another artist. I can't remember her name right now. I think it was Emily, maybe. Um, she was a couple of tables down from me. Uh, and um, she was doing like dollar drawings. And I was like, you were doing what? Oh, and Sam. Sam, sorry. Sam? Yes, yeah. I think so. I think you're right. I knew it was a short name. 
Um, Sam Hall, yeah. Yeah, so I got her business card. Um, but she, uh, one of the guys that uh, was going to get a commission from me got a commission from her. And it was this beautiful little postcard watercolor thing that it was a transformer. And so like, and even though it, it had like, you know, wobbly lines and stuff, he knew what he was getting. Like he, he knew her style and she's like, she just kind of did it and it took as long, you know, a very short amount of time, but knowing that that style was going to help that short production time. And mm. so I need to, I want to try and find that, that niche of doing something. Cause some of these colored prints that I do started off that way of me doing little five by seven, you know, six by six sketches on these things uh, and doing them at, at conventions and just popping them up on, on the, uh, on the table and saying like, Hey, I just did this like an hour ago and it's, you know, 50 bucks or 60 bucks or whatever. And if it sells, it sells, it doesn't, it doesn't, I can sell it later, you know? And so the, like that kind of stuff was, um, is something I need to get back into if I'm going to continue along these lines. Cause I, right. I, I had the big commission prices and then I had my print prices, but I had nothing in between. And so if people didn't yes. want prints, but they couldn't afford like a full on commission, then I think they might've passed me by. But, um, I also, again, because I've been so busy, I didn't really promote pre orders as well as I should have. So there could have been more in, in that realm. Um, one thing that I, I want to mention and, and thank um, everybody for that, that did come out and pick one up, I still sold like eight or nine Starcross books over the weekend. Which is rad. Like, I mean, it's a good book too. Oh, so. thank you. Um, but it's also from 2012 and I haven't been able to draw a new Starcross in a long time. And everybody that's a fan of that comic has one. So... I more often than not get people saying, hey, Joel, when's book two coming out? Wink, wink. You know, when they see me at, at conventions. I mean, they, some people are really, you know, want one and other people are like, I know you're busy. I'm just you kind of like poking you in the ribs sort of thing. Uh, but that's more than often the comment. Uh, so the fact that I sold eight or nine books to people who have probably never heard of me and are buying a full yeah. book of comics after reading like two or three, you know, flipping through it at my booth, which I mean, I always encourage people to do. If people touch it or even look at it, it's like, feel free to flip through. Like they're, they're all online. Like it's not like you can't <laughs> read them all now. Um, so uh, for those people, like, thanks very much. It's, it's just a nice kind of nod to the body of work that it's lasted seven years and still speaks to people when they pick it up yeah. and find it funny. So that's, that's really cool. Um I also noticed that my price points this year made a difference. Um, so yeah. again, for people that are that are vending or new to, to vending, um, last year I had my large prints at $15 and I still had one print, one large like 11 by 17 storm print that was 15, but everything else I moved down to 10. Because uh, last year on Sunday, I put all the 15s on for 10 as like a last day of the con special and I moved a lot more of them. Uh, mm. this year I felt that it wasn't, I didn't see people hum and ha, and I didn't see a drive to the $5 postcard prints because the large ones were 15. I saw a much better mix of five and $10, um, yeah. five and $10 prints. And, um, and the difference in size is like the $10 prints are like nine by 12 or maybe 10 by 10, depending on whether they're a square or a, or a portrait. Um, and so I found that that having your, uh, knowing your price points for your convention, and it's hard if it's your first one, you're going to have to kind of take a guess or maybe talk to other vendors. But again, knowing anecdotally from other people that the ticket prices were more expensive this year, I thought, I'm just going to knock these down because it's still fine for me. Like it doesn't, it doesn't hurt my bottom line because it's like they're $15 and when you sell one, yeah, great. But if you only sell three, whereas if you drop it at 10 and you sell 10 then yeah that's way better right like it is in the, right. in, in, in the end it's it's worth it because the interaction the sign the print you know and and take the money that kind of sales interaction takes just as long for a five dollar print as it does for a ten dollar print so it's true it, it, you know for the for the amount of time and amount of you know thing that the, the amount of time that you sink into processing this stuff it's much better to have have options for people i find so uh i really enjoyed that um i feel like i've been on a rant for a while here but i want to talk to you about uh, the local artist panel because I was on it, um, but you mm. were you were at it. Um, I was at it. Yeah, so I was uh, at it for you. Yeah, well, <laughs> I appreciate no. that. Um, and well, and you had a couple of really interesting questions. I think were really cool. But I'm I'm curious from some of the attended the panel. I did a local artist panel. There was myself, uh, Hugh Rockwood, and Nathan Salmon. I think is his last name. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Nathan is a spray paint artist, and Hugh Rockwood is a comic artist in Toronto. Uh, I think Nathan's from out west. I can't really remember. Um, no, but, I think Nathan's here. Is he really? Okay. 
I, I know think he, he's from here. I mean, maybe like he, I see, maybe he travels I, the the con circuit because I know he, does, he mentioned that. I, I see him um, downtown a lot as well, like during oh, um, okay. Oscars festivals and stuff. Because he uh, again, he does spray paint art, so he's able to do those outside. Mm -hmm. Right, it's easy for him to do outside, so he just gets like an awning cover. Uh, if you know for the Buskers Festival and for Canada yeah. Day Week and whatnot, and just makes art, and he's able to like because it's so fast and it's so quick people like he can he can do a full i mean i can i do spray paint art like i i, I don't say i do it anymore because i don't have a space to do it but i would like to be able to do it more and i have done it you can make a full piece a well-structured piece in about 10 minutes right if that like even less really like 10 minutes is like you're taking your time but like i've done a piece in five minutes right cool. and it because like spray paint is just like you, it, you spray it it's on bristol board it's on like a sort of or if you get canvases, you just pre-prep them by putting on like a glossy spray on top so that right. you can move the paint around before it dries. And that way you can, you know, blend stuff and do streaks and, you know, you can do, you know, you, you it spray painted art is so interesting. I won't get into it ran on it, but it's, it's, it's something that can be done super, super quick. So he sells them for like, you know, for like out, outside for like 30 bucks a pop because mm. you can do them in two seconds. Right. Right, right. right. So it's, it's just a different medium. And um, it's really cool too. It's not, I mean, something that he was talking about in the panel was ba battling the stigma of spray paint graffiti versus what he does. Yeah, and so yeah. he, and he's got stencils and I didn't really stop by his table very much. Um, but there was, when I walked by, cause he was right close to the men's room. Um, mm -hmm. when I walked by, there were some really cool things where he had obviously drawn his own animals, like these little cute little like nighttime, they're almost like little, um, she creatures like, like little little like, black spirits with white eyes and and so they're silhouette on black and they're stencils but then he's got these beautiful bright colors like this magical wispy kind of fairy like stuff happening but then you've got mm -hmm. these weird little moonlit creatures that are all kind of like uh, dotted around the composition it's really cool stuff like it's it's really yeah really really neat stuff so um, but anyways we, we did this uh, local artist panel which was supposed to be a QA and a about like what it's like to, like to be an independent artist how do you make your living at it that sort of thing um, three people came, including you, <laughs> which was disappointing. Uh, but I still felt it was a pretty good conversation. Um, but it was hard because it was more about us being left to our own devices about how to talk about stuff because of the three people there, you were the only one that had any good questions because the other people were just like, no, we don't have any questions. It's like, you know, it's a Q and A, right? Yeah. <laughs> just, I felt kind of like, like, ah. It was really frustrating. From know, my point of view, it was frustrating, but I I don't know what it was like on the other side. It was from 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 an attendee standpoint. I feel like like th that time is like the point in the day where there's a huge lull, and you're kind of just like, okay, I'm going to something before the panel I I want to go to happens because yeah. there was something happening at nine that night. Not saying that you're just a throwaway panel. Um, but I feel I feel like it did you guys a disservice to put you at the time that you were put at. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think Dorks and Dungeons was still going on at that point. And oh, that's what it was. Um, yeah. Dorks and Dungeons was still happening. And that's a that's a big draw. Like that's in the draw. main ballroom and it's full usually. Yeah, uh, it's a big show. Right. Um, so I, I feel like yeah, I feel like for you guys, it was a bit of a disservice. But um, no, you guys had some really great stuff to talk about. And you had some good, you know, some good responses. I was asking questions because I know, like, for some people, they may not feel comfortable asking questions, or they may not know how to ask a particular question that they had in their head. Right. Um, so you know, I was trying to keep the conversation going <laughs> uh, by asking the questions that I did ask. And um, you guys had some great responses to it. Like it was a good, um, it was a good dialogue, and I, I I like close panels like that. Like I I prefer smaller panels versus large ones because when you're in a large, like I didn't go to any of the big ones. I think I went to I went to Dorks and Dungeons because it's a show. I right. think of it as a play. Yeah, um, performance. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a it's a it's a improv improv comedy. Um, but with smaller panels like that, like I would never have gone to any of the other panels like with John Berryman or any of the larger people because like as fun as they probably would have been and as hilarious as apparently John Berryman was, um, I, like like you, you kind of just feel like like a mass spectator at that point as opposed mm. to someone having an actual dialogue. Like your panel and the panel I went to with uh, Sarah Tollefson from Twitch and ALB uh, from YouTube and Tumblr. Um, they had much smaller panels that 
allowed for a lot more dialogue and more personal interaction, which felt a lot nicer personally. Um, but no, like your like your panel specifically, like you were. I mean, I feel like you you were you didn't get a chance to talk as much um, hmm. in in your panel, but that's you know that's no one's fault. Um, but it was um, there was a lot of you know really really great conversation to happen, and it, and you gave some very good advice. Well, thanks. I mean, I think too that. Um... In a larger crowd, we would have had a more diverse conversation. Um, yes. We ended up zeroing in on like getting started in art, like how to get going. Mm. Whereas I think the panel was kind of billed as how to make a living as an artist. Like you already know how to draw. You're perhaps a hobbyist or maybe you table at conventions, but you're stuck at your accounting job or whatever it is. And you really want to try and do this professionally. And we were there as three professional artists and to have to field questions about that kind of thing is that's how it was pitched to me. Yeah, um, I think the issue, even though the good intention of of the convention was, we don't want to interrupt your table, so we're going to mm -hmm. wait until the convention floor vendor floor closes at seven, and we're going to have your table your panel at eight, which means you can go grab a bite, have a break, go for a walk before you go to the panel. The problem is, I think um, that anybody that's worth their weight in salt at the front of that panel won't mind losing an hour in the middle no. of their con day for a room no. full of 60 people, you know, or 40 people or 20 people. Because ultimately, if you're going to take your time away from your table or an hour out of your day, regardless, because I mean, I would have much rather been on my way home or eating at that point. Because uh, I mean, this was Friday, I was up at six, I was at the con by eight loading in. So there it is eight, eight o'clock at night, 12 hours later, and I'm starting the panel. I didn't eat dinner Friday until 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Mm. So it was one of those things where it was like, I was, once I realized there was no one there, while it was a good conversation, it was just like, this isn't, this is taking an hour out of my day where I really should be recharging and eating and even going home and working on commissions, but I can't. And it, I would have much rather just taken an hour because uh, I don't think you're going to really lose that many sales. And if people really want, to find you, you're only away from the table for an hour. And if there's someone there or a, even a sign that says at a panel back in 45 minutes, like they'll just come back. It's fine. You know, you're not going to lose that many. And, and like I said, the, the level of artists that you want at the front of that panel, they're going to know the value of speaking to a room of people and giving back to the community rather than saying, Oh, I'm missing an hour worth of sales. You're going to, you're going to miss, yeah. 20, you're going to miss 20 bucks, 30 bucks. You know, like it's not like you're going to miss, and time. even then I was there. <laughs> yeah. No, I was at your table. Right. So, I mean, if there were more people who had been coming to, um, yeah, yeah. If, I, if, if I'm, sorry, the, I'm if, gonna, if, I'm to backtrack a little bit. Yeah. If that had Go been, ahead. if that had been in the middle of the day, then I would have mm. asked you to stay at the table. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. I went because I didn't, the dealer hall was closed and I was waiting for, for friends to get out of a panel. And I also was like, ah, it's Jules panel. Like, I think I've gone to numerous of your panels before. Um, and, uh, you know, I always, I always find them very interesting. I always find panels in general very interesting. So I like to, to listen and maybe pick up some tips and tricks, you know, in places. Um, but, um, no, like I think, I think con wise from a scheduling standpoint, I, f I feel like, like I understand the intention behind it, but I feel like it was a disservice to smaller artists, especially when there was a larger thing going on. That is a, an annual draw to mm. the con every year. And the timing that it was, yeah, and I don't think it was a, a service to you guys. I think having stuff like that in the middle of the day when you may have a lot of younger artists who are who are there who are not mm -hmm. selling stuff yet, like the number of people who came up to talk to you and saying, "Oh, like you're so you are you like a big deal because you're professional." Mm -hmm. um, like there's a lot of kids who came up like what kind of markers do you use like asking very engaged questions mm -hmm. on like you know art and drawing that panel was geared towards those people and they were probably not there at the time yep well, or because, and because a lot to of go the, home because yeah. they were younger because they're younger yeah. I mean a lot of those a lot of those conversations I had at the table I mean they were at most high school at most yeah you know right so I mean like so that would have been a great panel in the middle of a day on a Saturday mm -hmm. um, you know for those for those kids who wanted to learn how to do that. But it was, I feel like it was a disservice to attendees and a disservice to you guys because you didn't have a big turnout. And, um, you know, for the people who probably would have benefited from that panel, they didn't get a chance to see it. Yeah. And again, that's all a learning curve, right? Like this is only the second year in that, in that convention space. Um, and, you know, 
I mean, now they've done been doing scheduling for the last 10 years. So, yeah. um, but you that's, know, but I, that's I, the I, thing. Like they, they're trying some new stuff and I, I know right. some of the organizers and I know that they were trying some new stuff this year. And it's one of those things where like they, they have stuff that works and they keep it where it works. Like dorks with dungeons, seven thirty, like that. Yeah. Like it's a good cap, you know, it's a, it's a good way to kind of pull everybody in because vendor floor is closed. You know, you're not screwing the vendors by having dorks for dungeons at, at 12 o'clock, you know, um, like lunchtime sort of thing. Uh, and so they know how that works. And I think that we just happened to be on a panel that was one of the spaghetti noodles that they're throwing against the wall. And I say, keep the panel, just move it, you know, just uh, move it to a different, a different time, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're concerned with like pulling too many vendors, then like have one of your comic guests, you know, like ask for the guest that's attending that has a table that's, you know, elsewhere like not a vendor and ask if they're willing to participate like my buddy um doug savage was there who i didn't get to see uh all weekend and he did say he wanted to see you i too. know like, I was in one of his panels and he was like oh i want to see joel and i'm just like i'm at his panel if you want to come with me but he had something to do yeah something um, to do slash again he flew in from bc for just a weekend he was probably jet lagged like there's all this we were supposed to go for a pint sunday night and i was feeling terrible like i had some not vertigo but i kind of had like the the exhaustion kind of fuzziness yeah. set in Sunday night. So when dad picked me up, I was just like, I didn't even want to stop for dinner on the way home. I had bacon and eggs for breakfast or for dinner Sunday night. Cause it was just like, I was going to stop and get some takeout, but it was like, you know what? I just want to go home. I just want to go home yeah. and have a hot shower and have some quick dinner. And I was in bed by 10. <laughs> like I was just, I was yeah. out. There was no way I was going for a pint at like eight o'clock with Doug. And he was the same way. He was just like, I leave tomorrow morning at 10. <laughs> like I got, I'm, I'm, there was supposed to be some post party thing and doug was like nope i just can't you know yeah. uh and so uh, but uh, him and his partner are looking at moving out here so hopefully they'll be oh, back good. out sometime soon in like a, a house hunting trip and i'll be i'll be able to spend more time more quality time more relaxed you know go have dinner not have to worry about a time frame sort of thing yeah. um but anyway uh you spoke earlier about conversations and, and connections and you mentioned sarah from twitch and alb yeah. from youtube so like who who did you get to meet this weekend that you felt was a really fun kind of highlight from the con there was well there's a lot of a lot of people there was a lot of really really great people at the at the con this year but the people i talked to the most was uh alb so alb her name's angelina but her her initials are alb um she is a youtuber um who's most known for her asmr work um, but she's also an artist and an illustrator and, and found it recently that she, you know, writes some content for CBC, which she doesn't own. Like, she's like, I can't say that I, that's mine because I've written it, but I don't own it. Um, but, um, but no, she was really sweet. Like I, I went to her, is a panel with her, Doug, um, Ash Barker and Sarah Tollefson. And it was like establishing a community or like, you know, content creation, establishing a community of some kind and um oh, that's cool that they had doug was. on that panel like a comic yeah artist. yeah yeah well so because i mean because doug yeah they had they had a, a twitch streamer they had a youtube gamer uh an asm artist and a, a comic creator because i mean because all of those foster different kinds of communities right yeah, like you absolutely. Got, the community in twitch gaming is different from the community of youtube gaming yeah right like they're, they're adjacent but but ash specifically works in um like tabletop gaming that's kind of what he focuses on ah, cool have you met ash i don't i feel like you and ash would get along um i feel like i have heard the name but it's one of those things where like i meet so many people in the course of right a, like i've met a yeah. thousand people this weekend and re i remember some but not all you know so yeah yeah um but i talked mostly to to angelina and to sarah um and um I wanted, there was another panel I wanted to go to with Ash, but it was just really busy at our table. And I also didn't want to abandon you. And um, I think I'd already gone to like two panels that day. So I was like, I'm trying to balance this out and make sure I'm there for you. And also not taking advantage of, of your generosity and giving me a free pass into the con. So I appreciate that. Um, oh, you're welcome. But, uh, I mean, but, it's, uh, it's, it's immensely helpful to have somebody else at the table as you probably uh, sorted yeah. out with the amount of time it takes me to sketch in a star crossed book and or sign prints, like to have somebody there to, uh, take the money, process the in, the engagement, and then just hand stuff to me and like dig yeah. under the table. It's so much so much more seamless because it gives me more face time with the customer. And then vice versa, if I'm working on a drawing, there's another set of eyes to go, hello, 
and I go, oh, there's someone in front of the table. Hi. Yeah. You know, like, because yeah. otherwise, sometimes I miss people when I'm in, into a drawing. Drawing like at the table down. is, yeah, drawing at the table is good because it does bring people over a little bit to be like, oh, what's he doing? Or like, oh, he's the, he's the artist. Like, this is not just a, a shop. Like, he's, he's a, he's the person that's drawing this stuff. But at the same mm -hmm. time, if you get into some finer details, I try to lean back when I'm sketching so I can at least look up a lot, but it's a hard yeah. thing. It's, it's like having a Twitch chat room, right? Like you got to look up every 10 seconds and I sometimes forget to do that because I like what I do. <laughs> I get sucked yeah, in. you just get it's really, like, really focused to what you're doing. It's like, hey, by the way, Joel, you're not home alone. <laughs> you should probably look up. <laughs> right. But no, yeah, no, Angelina and uh, and Sarah, I mean, like, I, I, and, you know, Doug and, and Ash by that as proxy as well were both really, really great. Um, uh, and I also met a local streamer and I can't remember his name. K Donny, K Donny is a streamer name. Um, I don't remember his his non Twitch name, um, but he was very nice too. I ended up talking to him afterwards, and he's a very, very, very nice guy. Um, and uh, so Angelina, I, I went to I went to one of yeah I went to a panel with uh, Angelina, Doug, Ash, and Sarah, and uh, I ended up running into Angelina afterwards as I was leaving with my buddy, and she was just like, "Hey, thanks for coming to my panel." Because I guess I I just asked a question. A standard question and she was like that was a really good question not a lot of people would have asked that um and then i mentioned that you know i was coming to another one of her panels tomorrow and um and she was like made it a mission to take a photo of anyone who was doing um uh, like a lord of the rings cosplay and then kind of like half decided that i was doing arwen like halfway through the day but also like i was like i have all this stuff for it i can throw it on and she was like oh we need a picture together so we got one together the next day um but by the end of the weekend, she was just like, she came up to find me and she was just like, thank you for like asking really good questions. You came to everything that I did. And, um, you know, she was just, you know, she's like, message me on Twitter anytime. So she was really, really sweet. Um, nice. And then with Sarah, like I, I had cracked open a monster in one of her panels and she was like, oh man, I could really use a monster. And the monster booth was like literally down the hallway. Like it, it was like maybe 10 feet away, if that. Um, and I was like, I can go grab you one. She was like, Oh no, you don't have to. I'm like, it's right there. What kind do you want? She was like, Oh, okay. So I grabbed her one, and she like ever since then she was like, Ah, you're like my best friend. So she, when she came to the table, she yeah, was I like, got to meet her. She's really nice. She's very very sweet, and she's very like down to earth, and she's really, you know, she I I can see why she has as many Twitch followers as she does because she's just a very genuine wholesome person. Um, do, you, do you remember her Twitch handle? Yeah, it's Sarah Moni. So Sarah spelt normally and M O N Y. Um, is her Twitch handle Sarah with an and H? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, M O N Y, and she's did she? <laughs> I like I was asking because I've kind of been like half thinking about getting into Twitch. I just you don't have should. I think you've got. I think you've got the the personality for it, and it's it's a lot of fun. It's yeah, it's a lot of fun. I just I don't I only have a, a laptop right now, and I know people are saying I have a laptop, and that's all I worked on, and it was totally fine. But I was like, what do I play? And it's more I play about internet. It's more about internet connection than it is. Yeah, processor and I, I will be honest, my internet connection is not great. Mm -hmm. But I've been I've been looking at different internet providers to get us a better better network. Um, but I mean, I have still see that people play with even shitty internet connections and they kind of make it work for them. But, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I, there's been a couple of things I've been thinking of doing with games, like if, whether it be YouTube or, or, um, you know, Twitch, I wanted to do like a nostalgia run of video games that I played when I was a kid, like Crash Bandicoot and, um, stuff like that. But I, you know, there's a couple of games that were really popular that I'd like to kind of give, give a look at, um, my friend Mitchell, uh basically loaned me his entire twitch like so he added me as like a friend to his twitch library not his twitch library steam library oh nice Ooh. um yeah and uh so he was like just play whatever you want anytime i guess and um you know it was good like so there's he's got a bunch of games on there that i'd like to try and take a look at i'm just trying to you know been doing some research on figuring out obs and and how to stream and and all that stuff and how to make it work and well shoot, um, me, oh, shoot me some questions when when we have time because i i struggled I with that um a lot and i can do my best to help out uh and and point you in the right direction it's co it's complicated and it's touchy it's one of those things that mm -hmm. just breaks for no reason uh but if you know the usual culprits then you can often fix it quickly yeah uh, yeah but there have definitely been some streams where obs has like delayed my stream by 45 minutes and then i get in there and i'm like Woo -sa. 
Woo. <laughs> like I have to calm down and be positive before I start streaming. Otherwise, I'm just yeah. going to be like a ranty. Like no one, I caught myself one time being like, okay, this is the third stream in a row where I've started it with not cursing, but like basically bad mouthing OBS. And I need to just like, okay, rein it in. <laughs> just need to stop. Except it that it just sucks. And there's not much that you can do about it, um, depending on the platform that you stream on, that sort of thing. But yeah. But yeah. Um, before we wrap up, uh, I have to mention uh, the flip of the low turnout for the local artist panel was the Minecraft panel that I did on Sunday at 3.30. The room was probably about 60% full, if not more. Uh, I want to say there was 30 or 40 people in one of the small panel rooms, which is good, uh, especially because I believe the costume contest was starting or happening at the same time. And uh, so what happened there was we had a panel called a, converse, a Minecraft Conversation with Joel Duggan and Pixel Riffs. Uh, obviously, it was uh, Johnny um, Pixel Riffs from uh, my Spawn Chunks podcast, for those of you that, that don't know. Um, so we called him on Discord via video, brought him into the panel, uh, and then I was, of course, there in person. Uh, the one kind of glitch was that there was some miscommunication in terms of how things are going to be recorded, and so Johnny had to record everything on his end, uh, we have the recording. We cleared it with the room. Uh, and so we are going to publish the recording of the Halcon panel probably later today, actually, on the podcast feed. So if you're not already, you can go over and check out uh, thespunchunks.com and you'll find that happening at some point later today uh, or, well, or tomorrow on your feed, depending on when you download your podcasts. Uh, but it'll show up in the same feed as the Spun Chunks. So if you've already subscribed to the Spun Chunks, it'll just show up as like a Spun Chunks special. Uh, but unfortunately, my audio, even though it was fantastic in the room, actually, so was Johnny's, uh, on the recording, it's a laptop mic that was like kind of embedded up by the webcam. Mm. Uh, so all we ended up doing was like, I kind of half clamshelled the laptop, pulled it up close to me. This was the convention laptop. And so, so Johnny could hear me clearly. So my audio on the panel uh, as far as podcasting is concerned, it's kind of crappy. It feels, well, it feels very much like I'm on a laptop room mic in a giant room full of people. Um, and so, and at some points I had to repeat questions so that Johnny could hear them because of course that, that mic couldn't pick up the room. You, you get the impression that there's a crowd of people and there's some murmuring when there's a question, but you couldn't really hear it clearly. So there is a little bit right. of repetition here and there for Johnny's benefit. He did a really good job. I feel of editing it down. And it's like, in some places it was clear from what I was saying that he just cut out the space where the person asked the question. And rather than hearing it twice or having this weird lull, he just kind of like removed the person asking because it was inaudible anyway. And so it's just me saying, ah, our next question is, and then kind of going from there. Um, so it's a little bit of a, of a jar from our usual podcasting quality, but I think the experience for people that were there uh, was really, really good. Uh, on the most recent episode of The Spawn Chunks, which we published on Monday, episode 63, we talked a bit about the panel, about my kind of feedback on it. So I won't get into it here. I, we talked a good chunk of it, about it at the top of um, the Spawn Chunk six, episode 63, as well as the render distance. I get into a lot more. Um, but there was also, on episode 63, uh, a discussion about the NVIDIA RTX ray tracing gameplay. Pix teased a little bit about that at the panel. And so if you were there at Halcon, or if it's something that interests you, on episode 63, we did a full kind of roundtable discussion at the end of the show about ray tracing in Minecraft, like with light shafts and colored light and like real shadows. And like, and um, I'll have a link for it here in the show notes as well for today. Uh, Johnny has a, a video out. He was invited to London to buy NVIDIA to check out this ray tracing technology and play the game. And so he's got a video out about it where he talks about, you know, his experience and shows it. And then you can go listen to the spawn chunks and hear him talk about it in, in greater detail. Um, it's very definitely both worth a listen uh, if you're into Minecraft or if you missed the Minecraft panel uh, and you had other things to do at Halcon and, and you couldn't make it. Uh, but we had some really great um, people. We had a great mix of folks there. Uh, and I think that it was um, it was a good thing. I'm hoping to do it again, whether it's at Halcon or maybe a library event or something. Like I'd, I'd like the idea of talking to people about Minecraft because as popular as the game is, we had some hardcore questions from some hardcore eight-year-olds, uh, but we also had some very inquisitive questions from grown-ups that are just like, my kid is really into this and I've got no idea what's going on. Like, how, how do I get started? Where do I, where do I look? What do I do? And it was great because it means that the parents are going to be able to engage 
you know, and play with the kids rather than the video game being something that pulls the kids away from the family, you know? Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, and that was really cool to see. We also had some adult players. I noticed some people that I met at the booth uh, were down there. So shout out to Danny, and I'm assuming it's her partner, and I forget his name, unfortunately, but they're from Fredericton. You would probably remember them if you were at the table when they came by. Um, but they were from BC and Ontario and they moved to Fredericton and then they heard about Helcon. They're like, Oh, we're going to that. <laughs> so, uh, but it was wonderful to meet them. And I had a lot of really cool engagements and conversations, uh, at the booth, uh, this weekend, including, like you said, a number of young artists. Uh, if you are a young artist, I really encourage you to talk to me or even just approach other artists that you really, you really like. If you see work that you, you like, we love talking about our stuff. So if you can politely ask questions at the table, we're more than happy to, to answer them, especially if there's no one around. Like if you're the only person at the table, take advantage, pick our brains. It's really fun to encourage young artists and, and see, um, see young people in, you know, interested in doing this. Because at that age, you're at a point where like you can, if you're that interested and that dedicated, you could potentially make it at least part of a career, you know, whether it's in design or video games or like whatever your creativity kind of, where, wherever it pulls you, you could totally do that kind of stuff. And that's something I do really like about conventions. And as a closing thought, I always feel recharged after things like Halcon, after I've slept a couple of days because of the engagement with people. Like I work yeah. by myself all the time. I, I talk to people on podcasts like you and Pixel Riffs, but like I don't get to see a lot of people and I don't get to see right. a lot of people in my field. So when I get to talk to other artists, when I get to see other young artists and encourage them and say, keep drawing, just whatever it is, if you're, if you're into it, just keep doing it. Like I, I'm not saying it's easy, but here I am on the other side of the table and I'm doing it. And so like, if I can do it, you can do it. You just have to put your nose down, you know, and, yeah. and to, to be able to encourage that and to encourage the number of young female artists that I saw coming up to the table, which was by far the, the larger demographic than any chance I have to do that is always fantastic. Cause if there's one thing that my industry needs, it's, it's more, more women, you know, pushing forward in, in the field. Cause it's traditionally comics can be kind of a male dominated thing. And it's just a stat. It's no real rhyme or reason. It just kind of happens, happens to be where the cookie crumbles, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But anytime I see someone interested in my kind of art, the cartoony, comic-y stuff that happens to be a young woman, I was like, yes, do it, do it now, because the, it's just so much fun. You know, like it's, it's a, as much as I will complain to friends about like the freelancing woes, it's got nothing to do with what I do and more to do with just being a business. Like that's, it doesn't matter whether I'm a baker or whether I'm, you know, uh, uh, any other field. If you're an independent, it's, you always have the same entrepreneurship challenges. And that's, that's what I find difficult about what I do but it's not what I do that that it sucks the life out of me it's all the business stuff <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, when, yeah when you're an artistic person having to deal with all the business end of stuff is just yeah so crushing but I will say like like every time I leave Halcon I leave feeling very inspired and very like I, I want to work at stuff now which mm-hmm. I feel like it helps like something else I want to touch on I know a lot of people end up getting what they call like post-con depression or post-con sadness or like when the end of a con happens you've just had such a whirlwind of a weekend and then when it's suddenly over and like for me on Monday I had to work at 10 a.m the next day right and I was just like oh okay that yeah. like like Monday was day it was like it wasn't even a long day I was only there for four hours but I was just like I don't want to do this I was lucky was and, just... and Johnny pushed the recording of Spawn Chunks to noon so I worked half days I only worked Monday afternoon and Tuesday afternoon mm. so it gave me a chance to sleep in not set an alarm that sort of thing but... see if I could stay home and just do Twitch or do YouTube all day. <laughs> that would be a fun time. I'm yep, sure I would really enjoy yep. that. But like, well, yeah, we'll see. Like, I'm going to try and look at Twitch now. Like, now that I've talked to people and I've kind of seen the benefit of it. And um, I mean, I've always seen the benefit of it. But like, you know, I've talked to people who are just like, yes. Like, aside like aside from yourself. Like, how talking to multiple people who are just like, yeah, Twitch. Like, this is great. And I've been like entertaining the idea for a while. Like, ever since mm-hmm. you were just like, you should, you should stream. And I was like, I don't know. I'm not sure. But like, you know, having you know, people who are not your close personal friends be like, do the thing. You're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Just having other, like more, more people tell you to do this thing. Oh and, yeah. When, uh, when the general public gives me feedback versus close friends and family, then I obviously think, all right, yeah. well, I'm, I'm on to something here. Right. If, something, if, when yeah. strangers start saying, I like what you do, then you're like, okay, well, I've, I've, okay, obviously there's yeah. some value. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hear you. And, you know, and trying to, you know, find the, you know, the inspiration to start doing more YouTube stuff. And, yeah. um, you know, like I just, you just leave, I just leave Halcon feeling very inspired. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I guess like for those of you who've been to Halcon who listen to the show or who go to conventions in general, if you are having a hard time, 
you know, getting back to reality afterwards. Use that, you know, excitement that you find over the weekend to fuel your inspirations because it kind of helps. It helps with the post-con sadness for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that's that's kind of what that's that's what I'm doing, and that's what I'm using. I'm using all that energy to put out good things into the world. So. I like it. I think that's a good place to, to wrap it up. So if mm. you have enjoyed this episode of the Citadel Cafe, you can find more about the show at the citadelcafe.com. We'll have links to all of the stuff that we talked about today, including some of the people that we connected with at, uh, at Halcon. You can email the show at the citadelcafe at gmail.com. Find us by name on Twitter and Facebook. Subscribe on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, and Spotify. But of course, sharing the podcast via word of mouth is the best way uh, to uh, to get the the podcast around, uh, there are seven hundred thousand podcasts out there, and still the number one way that podcasts grow is word of mouth. So if uh, if you like this poker friend in the arm and say, hey, you should listen to it because they're really cool, uh, biased opinion, but hey, you know I'm I'll, I'll do it. Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Cosmic Dancer Sarah, who is one of our major supporters on Patreon. Uh, she is supporting at a tier where she gets to rule the roost, basically, and get and gets the credit <laughs> for supporting the show because uh, she's awesome. Also, a, a great member of the Discord community. The Discord community? What's that? Well, that is where we hang out and talk about nerdy stuff all week long. And if you'd like to participate, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe, become a member, support the show where, wherever and however you'd like, and you get an entry into the Discord chat. And we can hang out and talk about nerdy stuff all week long. And of course, the Citadel Cafe is 100% supported by patrons, and I very, very much appreciate it. You guys are fantastic. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything that I'm doing online at joelduggan.com. That includes my illustration and design portfolio and my online store, which I don't mention enough. So if you missed me at Halcon and you saw some prints on Twitter and Instagram that you might like, they're available. They're just available online. A little bit of a wait in the mail, but hey, you can still get them. You can find me at Joel Duggan on social media, including Twitch, which I, I do a lot of Minecraft streaming and whatnot. And of course, the Spawn Chunks uh, at thespawnchunks.com, where I podcast about Minecraft with my buddy, Ma uh, I almost said my buddy Megan. That would be fun. We should have you on the show sometime. My buddy Johnny. Right, I know. <laughs> Johnny is the guy that I do the podcast with. It's not hard to tell that I've been talking nonstop for like five days, right? Like Right. Like... And your brain is just scrambled. <laughs> yeah. I feel you. Yeah. Megan, where can people find you and all of the awesome stuff that you're doing online? Um, everyone can find me online on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Omegan Townsend, and maybe possibly Twitch at some point in the future as well. Who knows? You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap, but you can only pick two. 